you've written a great deal about the great change. What do you mean by the great change and how do you see it unfolding in the years ahead? When I first proposed the book to uh, New Society back in 2005, I wanted to do a book on um, the life after petroleum and the, the transition from our current petroleum era into something that's going to come later. And I called it the great change because I saw it as that's probably the most likely thing that they'll call it a hundred years from now. They'll look back and they'll say, okay, that was the great change. And great in the sense of um, big, but also in the sense of, yeah, that was an important major advance. We, we really made a really good choice there. Well, New Society didn't like it. They wanted the Post-Petroleum Survival Guide. That sounded like a subtitle to me, but New Society likes to put out like lots of practical things. So, all right, we got rid of the great change. So uh, that became my blog title, and I continued to explore this theme after the book was out of can we have a, a transition that's graceful and fun, and can we uh, create a society that comes after that's better than the one that was before? And, it, you know, it's a matter of some debate. Some people don't believe that, that that's going to be the case. But I think that it is possible, and I, I also put out the uh, idea of this should be a cookbook uh, because uh, that's a way of bringing people together in the community and around a table and discussing things. And uh, also, you know, I would have made it into a children's coloring book if I could have because the whole idea really is that this is about families, it's about friends, it's about making a transition to a more community-oriented society rather than cocooning in front of a plasma television and going to work in front of a cubicle or in a cubicle staring at another kind of uh, cathode ray tube. So uh, really what we need to do is to begin to uh, re-examine the kind of life we live and what would we most like it to be like and for those of us who are putting on weight as we age, uh, the sedentary lifestyle is probably not what we want. We want something more active. We don't necessarily want to be in the hot sun, sweating, uh, hoeing, and digging weeds. But we might want to be, uh, you know, bicycling or somehow uh, enjoying life with friends in some common activity. And so let's think about that. Can we have uh, a common garden where we work together and sing while we work? Can we have um, shade breaks where we get out of the sun and uh, hang out and talk? Uh, can we bicycle to work? Can we um, uh, turn our bicycle into a power generating station and make electricity uh, that's stored in a battery for overnight use? Those kinds of things. Can we, can we generally design our life to be in keeping with the natural cycles and what's needed, but also fun. And my, my underlying feeling is, yes, it's possible, but as time goes on, we tend to foreclose our options on how to get there. You've said that we're giving Gaia a prefrontal lobotomy. What do you mean by that? We've evolved through the course of millions of years from simian ancestors and we have very linear ways of thinking. When I'm out on my um, bicycle, uh, I might be uh, you know, on a mountain bike in rough roads and, and where we are in Tennessee there's a lot of clear cutting of the forest and so I'll go out on the forest trails and, and sometimes it's very ruddy and, and if, I'm in, if I'm thinking from the standpoint of the bicycle tire the bicycle tire sees the rut and it stays right in the middle of it and it just keeps going and as long as it goes in the rut and stays there it's fine it's happy but as soon as it gets out of the rut it gets very shaky on either side and it has to cross ruts and it gets very difficult to, to, to ride well I sitting up in the seat can see the whole landscape and so I see where the rut is and where the rough ground is the bicycle tire can't see that. It just sees straight ahead. It just sees smooth sailing. Well, the bicycle tire is like human intelligence. It's linear. It sees one problem. It solves it. It sees another problem. It solves it. It sees another problem. It solves it one after another in a succession. Uh, Gaia is an intelligence that's nonlinear. It sees the bigger picture. When you jingle something over here, it jangles over there. You can't explain why that happened. They're just connected. 
The whole thing is an interconnected web. Well, when we begin to destroy pieces of the web, we take out species of frogs or spiders or some kinds of animals or fish, we're losing a piece of the intelligence that makes it a nonlinear intelligence. And that's what I call lobotomization of Gaia. We're going in there without even thinking, without even knowing the consequences. We're removing whole parts of Gaia's brain. And we can expect her to function well when we're doing that. Given that fact, and given all of the other damage that we're doing now to the environment, climate change, and all of the other dire predictions that are facing us now, how is it possible that we can think of a future that uh, incorporates this change in a, in a pleasant and positive way? I often wonder that. I have this, um, what I call my Houston moment. Uh, not in the sense of um, Houston, we have a problem, uh, but more in the sense of I was in Houston, Texas when I had this moment, uh, which is, oh, we really did blow it. It really is over. Uh, humans had the, their chance, their day in the sun, and now it's the, the swan song time. Bye-bye. Thanks, thanks for all the fish. Uh, but we're gone. And um, so we, you know, you could also say, well, fine, let's enjoy our way out. It's not going to be very enjoyable over the next few centuries, even if we survive, because the temperatures are getting a lot warmer. Climate is changing in ways that are going to be very hard on us. Uh, and so we're, we're going to suffer the consequences of previous karma. But I think that uh, there is still the faint glimmer of a way out. And even going through the process of going to Copenhagen, uh, sitting through all of the discussions there, being in the Bella Center when the politicians came in and sort of overthrew all of the non-governmental organizations and all of the good work that was being done, uh, I still have a glimmer of hope because I see a way out. And because I can see that, I have to be like, you know, a person in a lifeboat and the lifeboat has a hole, and it's sinking, and, but I have a can. Uh, so am I going to sit there and bemoan my fate, or am I going to use the can and bail? And I'm bailing as fast as I can, as long as I can. I'm trying to sleep as little as possible. You know? And at my age, I should be thinking about a nice, comfortable retirement somewhere, and instead I'm harnessing up again and going back out and working for very little pay in very difficult conditions in many parts of the world in order to do what I think is the solution. So you might ask, what is the solution, Albert? <laughs> <laughs> what is the solution, Albert? <laughs> the solution is uh, permaculture. It's uh, beginning to learn, live as if tomorrow did matter, to begin to redesign our built environment in ways that nature supports and wants to do. Nature wants to heal herself. Mother Nature is looking out for our interests despite all the abuse we give her. And she wants to heal herself, and we can live in a healing way with her. We can't live in a continuing abusive relationship. That won't last. But we can live in a healing way, and we are beginning to live in a healing way. And I think that that's actually something that I can teach because I've had some experience in seeing lots of people who are doing that sort of thing and how that works and how it's easy to design. And so that's what I do is I go and teach that. And, uh, and along the way, I've found some new technologies and ways of um, bringing carbon out of the atmosphere that I think will help us to get back in balance.